Me too. Hi, I'm Steve Hassan, and I'm so honored to have with me two guests. Normally, I only have one, but I've gotten two uh, incredible people who have agreed to spend some time to share their deep knowledge with me, Craig Unger uh, and Yuri Schwetz. And Craig, I read uh, House of Trump, House of Putin in my research for my book, Cult of Trump. But when I read your most recent book, American Compromise, I learned new things. And Yuri was one of your main sources, I believe. Absolutely. And, and Craig, in a, in a previous interview, I heard you refer to him as deep throat. Like, well, I, Yeah, I mean, I, I didn't want to go forward with these allegations based on an anonymous source. And I asked Yuri, and he's been uh, 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 kind enough, and I think brave enough to come forward. I mean, what he's done, uh, and, and he's been a vocal critic of Vladimir Putin for many, many years, and it's stepped forward uh many many times uh, that's incredible so if you don't mind yuri let me just start with craig and then we'll come to you and yeah. we'll have a conversation uh so craig i really want more people to read american compromise i've been sharing it on social media um and in our last conversation you shared your your frustration along with my frustration with my book that you weren't getting more media attention because of the importance of your book. Tell us what, tell, tell the listeners like what they need to know. So they want to go and buy the book. And right. well, uh, well, one interesting thing, by the way, is we've gotten enormous press outside of the country. We've gotten a lot of press in Russia, in Great Britain, uh, in uh, Israel and Poland and elsewhere. And it, but it's been odd that we haven't gotten any, very little from mainstream American media. I, you know, I, I think the, the thing that is still staggering to me, and I, I think we may I make a very, very, uh, well, one critic called it an unassailable case that Donald Trump was cultivated uh, by the KGB. And this is something uh, that has been uh, alleged, a lot of people have suggested this, John right. Brennan, really high level, powerful people in the uh, intelligence establishment, James Clapper, uh, John Brennan, uh, um, uh, almost every head of, former head of the CIA before Trump. And yet uh, no one's actually put it together what happened. And I, I think what I did in this book is it is the first a uh, richly detailed narrative of how the KGB did that, how they cultivated them. And it's a series of events. One thing I do, you know, it used to be a big deal when a spy was unmasked as a spy, uh, wh whether it was Jonathan uh, Pollard or uh, Robert Hansen. Well, yeah. there are at least four people in my book who uh, I tie, with, with Yuri's help, of course, to uh, the KGB for the first time, I think, in America. And what you, you see it going back more than 40 years, this is not one huge ingenious operation. Rather, it's a series of events that started using KGB protocols. And it starts back in 1980 with the simple purchase of television sets from an electronics store. This is Donald Trump's first really successful real estate development. It's the Grand Hyatt Hotel, uh, which is right next to Grand Central Station here. Like every hotel, it needed TV sets. But what was unusual is Trump was purchasing them from uh, a store owned by Soviet emigres, which is very unusual. And uh, as, as Yuri and other sources have suggested, but Yuri was the first, uh, one of the owners, Semyon Kislin, was a so-called spotter agent for the KGB. And that meant his uh, job was to open the door and spot potential recruits. And that's how this thing began. Right, and uh, so, and it's clear that the Soviet Union was very interested in connecting with any American businessman of any kind during the height of the Cold War, if I'm understanding that correctly. 
Right. They, they were uh, recruiting wildly, as, as Yuri will tell you, but uh, they did recruit American businessmen. Donald Trump at that time uh, was not that famous. He, he, right. It was not until 1983 when Trump Tower opened that he started to become a national figure in the United States. But uh, uh, one of the Soviets who, uh, one Soviet asset who had been recruited was the American businessman Armand Hammer. Uh, who uh, owned Occidental Petroleum. He got incredibly lucrative franchises with the Soviet Union, and he did favors for them uh, and was known as what, what Yuri calls a, a special unofficial contact. That mm. is, he wasn't an agent who could be tasked with specific uh, uh, orders as an agent might be, but he was someone who was reliable, who would trade favors, and they would do favors back and forth. And Donald Trump was recruited in, in that vein. Right. So uh, explain for our listeners the word compromat, because uh, assuming a lot of Americans don't know that. Well, it's, it's a Russian word that means compromising material. And it's basically, uh, you did something bad, and we're going to hold it over your head. Um, and uh, so I sort of see a lot of uh, what happened in Trump's world as, as being subject to compromise. For Trump himself, a lot of that is really more money. Uh, I've never found any sex tapes. And I guess until you find them, I don't see the point in really uh, going down that road. But, but I do think it's maybe valuable. Sorry for interrupting you, but I think it's maybe valuable because in your book you stated, and it was my understanding from other sources, that when Americans came to Russia, Often very attractive women showed up at the hotel. They'd go up to the room, have sex, and there'd be videotaping done, like as a regular thing. Is that true? Oh, uh, yeah, absolutely. And and we don't, it may have happened with Trump. We, I think we don't know the answer. I just didn't want to pretend. Uh, right. I, I have knowledge of, of that. And, and it seems to me clear that, there, that Trump did a lot of financial transactions that the Russians would have access to and that they were dubious, very, very dubious, including money laundering. And right. So but also I want and then I want to come to you, Yuri, but I, I want to just um, tell you that when I read your book and I learned about Robert Maxwell and Putin and the Mossad and Epstein, like, Oh my God. Right, there's a lot of stuff going on here. And unfortunately I don't have all the answers, but Robert Maxwell, who of course was the father of Ghislaine Maxwell and died a very mysterious death himself, falling off the prow of his yacht in 1991. Was he murdered? Was it suicide? You get the same question with Jeffrey Epstein too, of course. But Maxwell Sr., Robert Maxwell was quite close to the KGB and had a very good relationship with General Khrushchev. Um, and he, like Armand Hammer, was, was part of that world. And, and Robert Maxwell would trade favors, not just with the KGB, uh, but with Israeli intelligence, the CIA, whomever. Uh, so he was a big, big figure in that world. Right, and, and uh, my understanding is Epstein was recording, maybe not from your book, but from, from other sources. He was recording, videotaping people having sex with girls. and uh, Absolutely, there's, um, I, I actually saw one video from, from this so-called collection. I cracked down uh, a person who named John Mark Dugan, who was deputy, former deputy sheriff in Palm Beach County, not the, um, not exactly a high-ranking, powerful guy. If you've ever read Elmore Leonard or Carl Hyacin, he's sort of like one of those mm. Florida lowlights who's always looking for the angle on something. And I tracked him down by phone in Moscow, uh, and uh, he had left the Palm Beach County Sheriff's Department, and he had a vault with him, he said, that contained 478 uh, DVDs of sex videos that have been part of uh, the Epstein investigation. Uh, uh, Dugan fled the United States and ended up, it took the first plane he could get to in Moscow 
And mm -hmm. shortly thereafter, I think three or four days after he landed, he was meeting with a guy named Pavel Borodin, who was an enormously powerful Russian, who was sort of almost a mentor to Vladimir Putin and who had administrative authority of all the assets of the Russian Federation, roughly a trillion dollars worth of property. So why is he meeting with this low life of Florida? And I, I think Yuri uh, said, uh, no, the answer is, look, it looks like he's trying to buy some compromise. Right. So uh, before we move to Yuri, I just want to say again for my listeners who may not be familiar with your work, you did uh, a book, House of House of Bush, House of Sod, or did I reverse the title? House of Bush, House of Sod is right. Is yeah, you got it right. And, and you've been a professional writer for 50 years or more. Exactly. And my last five books are sort of along the same vein of how uh, the Republican Party has been at war with democracy for quite some time. Right. Excellent. So, Yuri, I'm so honored to meet you. Thank you for your courage. Um, can I ask you to introduce your credentials? Uh, how, did you, how did you become so knowledgeable about the KGB and Trump? <laughs> well, I, can. Uh, I worked with the KGB for the intelligence service. I see. This is an equivalent of American CIA because uh, sometimes people say KGB, KGB, and KGB. They don't understand what was KGB, actually. KGB was all 17 American agencies which make intelligence community except the defense intelligence agency. The rest okay. is the KGB. And you see, they are different, different people, different culture. Right, right. Uh, FBI, CIA, uh, then the agency which monitors uh, satellites. These are absolutely different people. So I worked in a Soviet equivalent of the CIA. And uh, I worked with department number one. It was the most important department because it was running operations against the United States and Canada. Canada was important only because it bordered United States. It was viewed as a springboard or as a door to the United States. Mm -hmm. And we had uh, three stations in the United States. This is the way it is right now, by the way. This is mm -hmm. DC station, New York station, San Francisco station. I worked in DC station under cover of a task, news agency task correspondent. The Yuri, can I just ask task? you, like how many years did you work for the KGB and I when did you total stop? 10 years. I uh -huh. stopped in 1990. I did it. I resigned on political grounds. Um, it was a year before the collapse of the Soviet Union. And then two years after collapse of the Soviet Union, I immigrated to the United States. So the country for which I worked for, it did not exist. Uh, and I was stationed in this country in the mid 80s. Uh, the department or the, the station which worked on Trump, it was New York department. While, as I said, I was on DC department, but uh, I'm sorry, station, but it was under umbrella of the same department. Yep. And I was at the very same time, I was cultivating an operation with a different source, which actually mirrored the operation on Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. And I was kind of too or three months difference in time frame. For instance, he was brought to Moscow in 1987 in summer, and I brought for the same purpose my uh, recruit, or um, how they call it, uh, the, the subject or the target in April of 87. Mm -hmm. uh, we use the same modus operandi, the same protocols. Um, so a lot of things which is described in the book as dots connecting, describing the entire Trump Russian intelligence operation, they were known for me almost firsthand. And then uh, I had, after Donald Trump was, was elected the president, and I realized that a disaster happened because it looks like the Russian intelligence agents is right now the most powerful uh, official in the world. Yeah. 
I was in shock. So I spent another about three years to do additional investigation to connect, to, to find out missing um, dots. Um, and then we pulled them together and we had what is described in Craig's book. Uh huh. And you wrote a book too about your experience, am I correct? Yes, I in 1995, I published a book. Um, the book was published by Simon and Schuster in New York. My right. publisher. I just happened to find it. One right. Of... <laughs> I, I was going to ask you, but I didn't want you to get yeah. up to look for it's, it. It is out of print already because uh, it was published in 95. Um, and it was kind of a fresh experience of intelligence guy whose country had gone. It doesn't exist anymore. And we had a joke, by the way, when the Soviet Union collapsed, we had a joke in Russia, uh, which goes like this. Uh, the KGB won the Cold War, but the Soviet Union lost it and collapsed. The CIA lost the Cold War, but the Soviet, but the United States won it, mm -hmm. and its arch enemy collapsed. So the big question is, who worked for who? <laughs> <laughs> right. But my understanding, my, under my understanding is Putin, you know, maneuvered and did even a false flag bombing to get power in Russia. But mostly their former KGB people became oligarchs. Am I remembering it correctly? Yes. But again, as I explained, KGB is too big, too big term, which is, does not adequately uh, describe the situation. Mm. Putin and his crowd, his closest team, are the people who worked for the so-called fifth KGB directorate. It mm -hmm. was neither intelligence, no counterintelligence, Unlike popular myth, Putin never worked for intelligence because he was found unqualified. Oh, that's interesting. Yes, if people worked in a KGB branch, which did it, does not exist, neither in the CIA or in the United States, nor in any civilized country. This is political police. These are the people who were chasing dissidents. Uh, they were looking for any sign, uh, signs of uh, political opposition in the country. They also the people who harassed academician Sakharov. Uh, they were those, they were the people who were looking for compromise on the Soviet citizens to recruit them and to turn them into snitch. Uh, wow. So um, there's so many questions I want to ask you, but I want to stay on topic uh, in terms of Trump because I want to stay categorically when I get interviewed now, people ask, uh, is there still a cult of Trump? And I say, if they believe the election was won by a landslide, then, then they're under the spell. And if they think Russia had nothing to do with Donald Trump or his election or his policy decisions, then they're in the cult of Trump. Am I right? Am I, do you agree with that uh, thought or any comment from either of you? Uh, you know, I, I do. I, I mean, some people may be just not paying attention, but I think those are two elemental parts of it. I, I mean, uh, the first one is a little different in that it, it, it's, it seems to me the, the election was so public, um, but following how Trump was recruited, uh, by the KGB is an interesting story, but it required paying detailed attention. And I also think um, a lot of the countries just in denial about it and they don't want to. And, you know, I, I mean, one of the, the questions I, I, I puzzle over endlessly is if this is getting such great credit, uh, is, is such so much publicity in the United Kingdom and in, in Russia, uh, why is it being ignored in the United States? And I think we're in denial about a lot of things in our, in our public life. And part of that would be how Donald Trump, th 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 this was a, um, a counterintelligence catastrophe. This is a national security catastrophe for the United States. 
So if you go to the FBI, they don't want to tell you how they screwed up. Right. Uh, they, they don't want to admit that. And I think they brush off the real questions, which I think we have to get to the bottom of or it will happen again. Yeah, exactly. And we know that there were huge hacks. We know, I mean, at the point that that um, uh, the FBI director was fired and there was a celebration in, in the White House with the Russians and Russian media and not American media. I thought that was the biggest tell. Like aside from Helsinki, and I, I, I believe Putin and not my intelligence people. That was another big one. Yeah. But um, I think it's absolutely vital for uh, Americans in particular to do their homework and understand the depth of the corruption of the Trump um, autocracy or whatever the right word is, for his attempt to create a, uh, an insurrection and destroy our country. Absolutely. Um, so can we talk for a minute about Opus Dei? Because you, you wrote about um, it in your book, Craig, and I wrote about it in my book. And I think that may be a piece of why I didn't get more media in the United States for my book too. In fact, one of the PR people actually said, if he thinks he's going to talk about Opus Dei on TV with, with and William Barr, forget it. So I don't know how true that is. I can say that in Boston, my hometown, uh, for years I was interviewed about cults and then nothing for 10 years. And then I was told by a, a writer there that the editor was Opus Dei. And then, wow. then, and then third, I was to present in Italy at Rome at an international conference for law and mental health. And uh, the conference... Uh, itself was threatened to be um, uh, canceled if I showed up to give my talks. And, and the person threatening said, you know, uh, A, he was part of Opus Dei, and B, I wrote a book about Trump. And so for me, I'm fascinated. I, I should also say I've helped people get out of Opus Dei and recover mm -hmm. from Opus Dei as an authoritarian cult. And, wow. and when I, and I recently watched a, a video of Robert Hansen's psychiatrist, he didn't talk a lot about um, any details with Robert Hansen, but it just didn't ring true to me to hear his explanation that he could be a devout Opus Dei member going to church every single day. When he first, when the psychiatrist first met him, uh, he was asked by Hansen to read a book about Opus Dei and then talk to an Opus Dei priest. When I heard those details, I'm like, there's not a chance in the world that he, in my experience with cults, that someone could do a spy operation without direction or approval within the cult. Like, I just don't believe in the story he wanted money or he wanted attention. Right. Right. Uh, with Hanson, I don't know the answer to that. With William Barr, I, I think it, there's more clear-cut relationship between the authoritarianism of Opus Dei and the authoritarianism of uh, William Barr's Justice Department, his judiciary, his uh, concept of the uh, imperial presidency, right. the military executive, which gave uh, enabled Trump to use so many powers that I, I believe far transcended what should have been the limits of power for the president of the United States. Yeah, 100%. Um, so I want to come back to you, uh, Yuri. And um, I also want to do a shout out to Jack Bryan and, and Marley Clements for Active Measures, which was a 2018 documentary about Russian influence for the 2016 election, which I thought was very well done. But can you talk about psychological warfare, Yuri, whatever you're comfortable saying about what's what's been happening and what you imagine has been happening? Oh, and I should add that I was recommended to read Peter pa Pomeratsov's book, uh, Nothing is True and Everything is Possible, about the media inside of Russia since Putin took over. Yeah. Any wisdom, 
And I want to ask you about Navalny and what's happening currently in Russia. Well, uh, they don't use in uh, Russian intelligence community terminology, psychological warfare in broad sense. They usually use it specifically the warfare you use on the battlefield or close mm -hmm. to the battlefield. In uh, general practice, they prefer active measures. This is influence operation. And this is the highest level of intelligence activity because on the first level, you look for targets, you recruit the targets, you obtain information, intelligence information from them. On the second level, they analyze the information. And on the third level, on the basis of this analysis, they make a decision what we want, how we're going to use it. And they start influence operation. Active measures, I almost quote the vocabulary, is an influence operation targeted on a specific individual in the government or specific social group in order to simulate, stimulate them to do something or not to do something in the interest of the, they call it instance, but this is actually the Kremlin or the leadership of the intelligence service. Mm -hmm. So obviously what the Russians did in 2016, 2020, and 2020, yes. it was big Russian active measure. You may be surprised, but I would say that from the KGB intelligence point of view, it was a silly thing what they did in 2016 and what they were about to do in 2020. Because I remember when I just joined the department number one in the summer of uh, 1918, my first boss, uh, experienced colonel who had spent overall eight years in the United States with success, with, with some successful operation, he told me, we have some capability to influence American presidential election. Some, <laughs> not a lot, but we're not gonna, we're not gonna use it. We're not, we're not going to meddle into those elections. And I was surprised. I say, why? He said that because if you meddle in presidential elections in the United States, our operation should be 100% perfect. Because if you fail and Americans understand what you are doing, the ramifications of your failure, of our failure, can be catastrophic. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what happened with Donald Trump's case. Because mm -hmm. what the Putin did, and as, as I said, he and his crowd, they never worked in intelligence, they had no experience. They were chasing you know, just Russian people, uh, the Soviet people, uh, turning them into snitches to spy on each other. Mm -hmm. So they did this operation in 2016 like a Soviet-style collective farm. Lots of people were involved, it was messy and they didn't do just one thing. They didn't put, uh, you know, uh, an announcement. This is the GIU who is operating here. Or this is the SVR. Uh, and it was realized by American government what was happening. So they got, it was a big success. They got their asset as a president of the United States. But for the next four years, this asset, he was cornered by the Russian failure. Uh, failure. He, they exposed him as an mm. as they asset. So for the next four years, he spent the time to prove that he was not an asset. As a result, he was not as useful for the Kremlin as he could have been if Russians didn't help him in 2016. So we have a situation where the Soviets recruited him, but the Russians exposed him and, you know, <laughs> uh, so they try to repeat the operations, the contents, uh, concept in 2020, but this time, instead of WikiLeaks, they were going to build and create a group of their intelligence asset in Ukraine, in Ukrainian parliament. Yeah. Uh, they were supposed to form a joint committee with pro-Trump, ardent pro-Trump supporters on Capitol Hill and Ukrainian parliamentarians 
and the, the, the Russian intelligence would pour uh, compromat on mm -hmm. Biden, uh, Joe Biden and Democrats. Mm -hmm. But fortunately in this particular case in the 2020, American government did what they were supposed to do in 2016. They just made clear that this information, what they're doing in Ukraine, this is a Russian intelligence operation and you should take it like this. Mm -hmm. Had it happened in 2016, had the US government, CIA or FBI or whoever it is, said that, look guys, what WikiLeaks and Assange are leaking actually is the operation of the Russian intelligence community. I believe that, well, the, 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 the um, Russian operation would have been exposed much earlier. Yeah. Right. It just it's and, and my understanding is that there are former American military intelligence, many involved with the Christian right that were colluding or whatever to try to push Trump and their own agenda, uh, their own authoritarian agenda. But um, God, there's so many other questions that I, I, I want to ask you. Can you talk about I was looking on Twitter and Navalny's attorney went to see him and she was just arrested. Tell us about Navalny. He was a poisoned. Yeah. Uh, he was saved by Germany, German doctors, I believe. Well, it's again, the, the, the story is much bigger than the Navalny himself, even though he's, he's a real personality. I would say that he is uh, one of the most important individuals right now in Russia. And this mm -hmm. is a question, who is more important, Putin or Navalny? Uh, he fell victim of what I would call transition of power in the Kremlin. Putin, and this is my assessment of the situation. Yes, I, of course. Based on the knowledge, uh, information I'm getting from there and uh, knowledge of their modus operandi. Putin is in declining health mental and physical. Uh, his most likely successors are the top leadership of the FSB, chaired by Nikolai Patrushev, mm -hmm. the chief of National Security Council. And uh, it appears that they have a strange uh, they have developed a strange form of running this country, which reminds me Italy in the 20s and the 30s, up mm. to 43, when they had big fascist council. And you have Duce Mussolini. So this national, this national security council in Russia actually turned into a big fascist council who mm. runs strategic issues of Russia. Mm -hmm. That was this institution led by Patrushev, who in the summer of last year produced the first time, produced and published uh, the strategy of uh, first use of nuclear weapons in Russia, making a statement that Russia was going and can use nuclear strike first under certain circumstances. It never happened during the real classic Cold War. Uh, while Putin right now, he shows up every day on TV sending signals that he's still alive. He's not poisoned by his former bodies with polonium or Novichok, but he's discussing things like removal of trash from the cities, what to do with uh, confiscated lumber. And uh, he, he is having meetings with uh, young authors writing books for kids in Russia this is not something he was discussing and he was speaking about just just a year ago. He right. traditionally represented himself as a strategist, you know. He did right. not even involve, uh, got involved in uh, economic issues. He was involved, you know. He was the guy who was discussing Yalta. Well, mm -hmm. how, how he would get together with president of the United States and divide the world on two parts and, you know. This, uh, now he's discussing trash issues. So in this situation, it seems to me, and this is a very dangerous situation because no, Navalny was in, uh, uh, poisoned and everybody is talking about Putin. Putin poisoned him. Now Russian amasses forces on the border, border with Ukraine and everybody points finger at Putin. This is the guy who is doing this. 
uh, I am afraid that Putin's state of health right now is such that one of his major daily preoccupation is to get to the toilet at the right time, you know? Wow. Not to miss it, you know? <laughs> it's not about Ukraine anymore. It's not about Ukraine. But this Patrusha and his gang, they're using the situation, whatever they do, any horrible things they do, they would put blame on Putin. I and see. Putin, and Putin wouldn't be able to say anything. So my take is, this is the FSB and the, the leadership of uh, Patrushev, who actually poisoned, and this mm. is a fact, that was the FSB poisoned. Mm -hmm. And I believe that Putin actually had nothing to do with this. Mm -hmm. like, uh, but the whole operation was designed again to show to the entire world, look, this guy is crazy. And this message is primarily for the United, to the, for the Biden administration. Look, this guy is crazy. We need to remove him, we'll replace him, we'll be better. Why they need it? Because in fact, they're worse than Putin. These mm. are the people who blew up multi-apartment buildings in Russia in right. 1989. These are exactly the people. These are the people who killed Litvinenko, Alexander Litvinenko in London with polonium. Yeah. These are the people with, who- Yuri worked with, by the way, Yuri worked with Litvinenko. And yeah, I, he was my business partner. Uh, so they are terrorists and they're monstrous. They understand that they're not acceptable. So they can, they, their idea, strategy is to make Putin the worst monster. Like he is worse than we are. So f we, if we remove him, we'll do a big favor to the world, mm. and therefore we should be accepted. This wow, is that's it. so interesting. I had not even conceived of that. But do you, I mean, last I heard, Navalny was on a fast, yes. and and I'm worried for him to live. Um, what's... I'm worried too because in this situation they can commit, they can make horrendous things in hope that they would put a blend, uh, 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 point of finger at Putin and make him a scapegoat. This is what makes the situation uh, extremely dangerous. And I believe it would make sense for the US administration to send a message back to Mr. Patrushev and his crowd that uh, they have been watched too. And their role in unfolding developments in Russia is not ignored. Right. But I can't imagine that criminals would allow Navalny to be a politician in Russia and have power. Is that correct? Well, I believe there can be only one successor to Putin, unfortunately. And this is the FSB leadership. Mm -hmm. There is no democratic movement that can replace the regime like it was in the 91, for instance. Including Navalny, do you mean? Or, or, uh, or it's just that would not be allowed to happen? Uh, well, because it's they've been working on this. The, 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 the FSB, Russian successor to the KGB, they broke up this uh, democratic or liberal movement against the regime long ago. It doesn't exist. Now, some people say that they may be inside the intelligence community, inside the FSB, they may be low, medium level pragmatists that can remove these monsters and uh, you know, replace it. No way. The structure of Russian intelligence community is such that there can be no internal opposition. Mm. This is just the leadership which will take over and we should be prepared for this. Wow. It's not going to be better, but they want to make themselves acceptable and accepted. Right. So you, you mentioned uh, Russia and Julian Assange and WikiLeaks. What about Rebecca, uh, and the Mercers and Cambridge Analytica? Were the Russians involved in any way with I data mining or anything? I don't think so. Uh, it's, it's, it would be too sophisticated for Putin. Because the trick is this, you know, you need to understand with the Russian intelligence, the, uh, the nature of this organi organization is such that the top boss is the limited factor of intelligence 
the modus operandi, etc. You can collect only James Bond type people mm -hmm. uh, in this agency, the most brilliant analysts you can have, but if you put this mediocre personality on Got the it. Top, you'll have a mediocre uh, intelligence agency. And this is it is. Just give you an example. Over the last several months, the Russian intelligence around the world has had more failures than the KGB intelligence over the entire uh, history of its existence. It's failure after failure after failure. Uh, it's, uh, you know, just speaking professionally, I just put aside the moral uh, evaluation of um, this operation, um, the story how they po poisoned Navalny. Mm -hmm. Just from a professional point of view, it's a story of idiocy. Just, yeah. you know. And, and, and I understand that there are a million Russian emigres that went to Israel. Yeah. And, you know, the Jewish right and Chabad, Putin's rabbi is a Chabad rabbi. Can you yeah. say anything about that yes, connection and relationship? I can, I can, I can. In the midst of my investigation on, for this book, uh, one of my uh, special point of special interest was Mr. Kislin. When and how he was brought into cooperation with the KGB, because I was when I was here, we all knew that this is our store. Mm -hmm. But I didn't know. Well, uh, when we met with Craig, I didn't know when it happened. So I went to Ukraine and I found an uh, officer who in the 70s uh, worked in Odessa KGB field office. Mm -hmm. And I guess it was, it was in the Soviet Union, like a Jewish city. Mm -hmm. uh, Three million people, like 90%, maybe, maybe close to this were Jewish, it's special culture, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, special literature, songs, language. Uh, and if you remember in the 70s, American administration was putting hard pressure on Brezhnev to let people immigrate right. from the Soviet Union. And Brezhnev had to comply for economic reasons. And then the KGB used the opportunity. So I was told by people who worked, they had set a special department for these purposes. Every family willing to immigrate out of the Soviet Union on so-called Jewish visa was approached by the KGB with the offer. If you want to immigrate, you signed a pledge to cooperate with the KGB. If you don't- Wow, sign, I didn't know that. That's in interesting. In handwriting. Wow. If you don't sign this right uh, and sign this pledge to cooperate, you are not going anywhere. And I was told that in 90% cases, people did, uh, did right and signed this. Thing. It doesn't mean that all of them, uh, immig uh, having immigrated out of the Soviet Union, became, became KGB spies. Right. But a small number of them, there was a, an indication on those who did. <laughs> sure. And the indication is this, people immigrate and then suddenly several months later or a year later, they turn to the Soviet Union as a partner, mostly in business. They mm -hmm. start working with the embassy, Soviet embassy or some other uh, agencies of, of Russia. So the question is, if you run from this hell where you have been oppressed, how can you you know, and this simple question, but no one in this country, primarily the FBI, did ask this question. You know, right? Uh, so that was the first time the influence the KGB used this channel of this massive immigration uh, for infiltration of their agents into the United States and in Israel. And there was a well-known case in Israel where they had the guy Shabtai Kalmanovich who was convicted and put in jail for being a KGB spy. Mm -hmm. But their number was much higher, much higher. Right. Uh, and apparently these connections which started, they started building at the time, in the 70s. They brought some results to Putin's government. 
because one of the first things Putin did was he got rid of their chief rabbi of Russia, who was chief rabbi under Yeltsin, yeah. and he put in charge his rabbi of Russia right. on the people. Laser. Of the Putin, yes, yes, yes. Um, similar story happened in Ukraine as well. Uh, and I heard that oligarchs were given Israeli passports. Is that oh, true? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, for different reasons. It's not uh, any more um, uh, like political or security. Well, it's security because many oligarchs were Jewish. I see. It's, not, it's not incidental because, okay. you know, how most of them uh, emerged. But again, it, it, it was unfolding in front of me. In the late 90s, the chief of the KGB, he said that uh, we need to develop our KGB business empire. But no one in KGB knew how to do anything in so-called market economy because it didn't exist. So the idea is we have people, many of them Jewish, who operate in underground black market, market economy <laughs> in the Soviet Union. So they uh -huh. were people and in the Soviet Union, they were viewed as arch enemies. And if caught, it was executed, capital punish, punishment. But now after Krichkov's uh, directive, they turned to them and the arrangement was simple. We give you resources, we work, we protect you, you do money and you kick back. You live yeah. a little bit for yourself, but most part you kick back to us. And this is a system which actually exists right now this is the essence of the putin's economic and political system right now in in russia yeah it's criminal and, and what did, why they choose jewish people because they believe that if he ever gets off the hook this guy we crack down on him and the russian people were will support us because it's popular you know in the uh -huh. anti-semitic country to harass jewish people you know Interesting. So it was. Uh, it was. It was a decision which was made with a purpose. Yeah. So can I switch and just ask the the powers and and Craig, you can chime in on this too, please. Uh, that are pushing that climate change is a hoax. You know, the human climate change is a hoax. I assume that Russia is part of this as well as Saud and and as well as Coke and, and industries. But uh, any any thoughts, Yuri? And then I'll ask Craig to comment. Yeah. Well, it but it's part of the strategic view uh, and uh, message Putin's so the Kremlin under Putin is projecting inside the country and outside of the country. The climate change issue is part of the more global issue of globalization. Putin is adamantly hostile to this view mm -hmm. because they say that Russia is special and this is for political, for domestic purposes, you know. Uh, democracy doesn't work for us. We have special country, special regime of thieves, you know, who can loot the country and stay in power forever. This is special regime, you know. So we're, we're not like others. So they reject globalization and they reject, reject climate change as part of this more general globalization project. And the third reason is that, uh, you know, they are focused on looting the country. Mm. Who cares about who happens after we go? You know, would I <laughs> to, to hell with the rest of the world? This is the mentality. They don't care on what's going to happen in the country in 30, 40, 50 years after, uh, after, after today, you know. It's incredible. And of course, they have a lot of fossil fuel uh, yes, wealth. This is, yes, yes. This is, this is essential. This is essential. This is their lifeline. You cut prices for this lifeline and the regime is gone. Right. Craig, I'd love to hear from you. Thank you for your patience, but oh, no, Yuri is I, fascinating. I, I, yeah. <clears throat> um, no, I, I, I'm not sure I can speak so much to climate change, but uh, part of the, what you see the Russians do is taking existing crises that are real, and it can range anything from uh, climate change to cults in this country, like, we, like QAnon. Yes. And uh, so Reuters reported not too long ago 
how Russia was fanning the flames of QAnon. And, and what, what you see here going on again and again and again that is so frustrating, I think for, from my point of view, is uh, so much of what is happening is legal. Uh, a colleague of mine, Mike Kinsley, coined a phrase I wish I'd coined it. He said, saying the, the real scandal is what is legal. And so much of what the Russians are doing is legal. Um, and, and you can see it through the, the powerful white shoe attorneys in Washington at the massive law firms like Kirkland and Ellis and Jones and Day. And if you're a lawyer there and you make more than $10 million a year representing Oleg Deripaska or Alpha Bank, effectively you're serving as a Russian agent. Right. You are. And I, and I think Americans are very, very slow to, to, to grasp this and understand the dangers of that kind of thing. Uh, and, and that's the, the battle. It's sort of an invisible war that's taking, taking place now. Yeah, wow. Um, what do we do, gentlemen, to try? I mean, Biden's administration is in. If, some, if you were approached and said, what are your recommendations for how to proceed to try to bring democracy, shore it up and such. What are your thoughts, Craig, and then Yuri? Well, one thing I, I mean, I think very strongly to finish, I mean, it, it has to do with the thought I was just saying, which is we have to tighten up some of these loopholes. The whole uh, K Street lobbyists, we, you know, for years I've known, most people have known how they will bend the rules to get, uh, 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 legislation for right. big pharmaceutical companies, for big oil, whatever, to bend the rules in their favor. And now they're doing it for the Russians as well. We have to sort of tighten up that kind of thing. Um, we, we have the same thing with, with uh, laundering money. Uh, wh one of the things I show in both of my books really is how in 1984, uh, uh, David Bogdan, when the Russian mafia comes to Donald Trump, puts down $6 million in, in cash and says, I'll take five condos. Well, that's how uh, Russian, illicit Russian money is laundered through Donald Trump real estate. These are all cash and transactions to anonymous entities. We have to change that. And there have been modest changes proposed in what is known as the Corporate Transparency Act. Um, but I think they're being watered down as we speak. Uh, that kind of thing goes in on in one sector after another. In uh, Silicon Valley, the Russians are there. L look the way is, uh, Facebook makes billions of dollars by promoting Russian propaganda. And we have to acknowledge what's going on and take measures to stop all of this. Yep, 100%. Yuri, your thoughts, sir. Yeah, there are two two things. First, uh, I see under Biden administration an incredible progress in understanding the nature of Russian government. Because the previous 20 years were spent in hope that if we talk to them friendly, if you cooperate with them, if we develop some project here, there, etc., we will turn them into normal people. I mean, by them, I mean people in, right. in the Kremlin. It's not going to happen. My personal 67 year old <laughs> experience clearly shows me without any doubt that the only language they understand is when they, they face iron fist in front of their nose. Only from position of force you can achieve any positive result with the current regime. And as I said, we'll unfortunately will have spent, we will have to spend many, many years with this regime. They're weak and they're bluffing. What they're doing right now in Ukraine, this is a bluff. And they've been scaring through their agents, through uh, uh, active measures for decades that Russians are so crazy that if you don't accommodate them, they will push the red button. They're not going to push the red button. Yes, they live like gods, you know, from rags to riches, and now you push the red button? No way. They, they enjoy life, they want to enjoy life. Uh, this is what should be done internationally. Position of force. Uh, because the more you talk to them on some 
peripheral issue, the more unhinged they become. Uh, second, they, uh, the, the nature of this Cold War to zero, how I called it, uh, is different from the nature of classic World War. In the classic World War, the key tools were nukes and rockets right. in, the, in the Soviet arsenal. These days, the major tools are intelligence operation, deception, which is part of intelligence operation, active measures, and corruption. They're buying out Western political elite. In Europe, they call it Operation Schroederization of European political elite under the name of Gerhard Schroeder, who was the chancellor of Germany and became Gazprom higher paid employee almost immediately after he stepped down from the public office. This is what they're doing in Britain. This is what they're doing in any major Western country. And this is what they did with Donald Trump. Yeah. But they want to do it on a massive scale, not just one. They want to corrupt the entire American political and business elite. They have lots of money for this, lots of cash. Yeah, and even with the Magnitsky Act, where external money was frozen, of course, you know, Putin wanted to undo yeah. that. Um, but China is also a threat too. I'm curious about Russia and China. Any any comment you want to add to, about that? Russia is a client state to China. Uh, I know I, I, I know this uh, school of thought which says that right now China is a major adversary. We need to focus on China and forget about Russia. But Russia still has lots of capabilities, intelligence capabilities. In intelligence, they're incredible. So in order to be good with China, and they badly need, they badly need money, they badly need technology, and if it's not coming from the West, they want to get it from China. So they need to do something to China to deliver. So I bet whatever they steal in the United States from the from or through intelligence, they can sell it to China for some uh, agreement, some deals, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So they are in one single boat, and this is how we should treat it. Yep, I I, I so appreciate your your opinions. So if Trump gets uh, criminally charged. We know he has a ton of civil lawsuits coming. Um, what are your thoughts? Do you, th do you think that Trump is a threat in any way, shape or form to Putin and Russia? Uh, would they want to get rid of him? Or is there a chance that he may sing and try to cut a deal? Any, you know, speculate. It's just totally opinion. But. They are... Uh in a wait see situation. They're looking at what's gonna happen next. Uh, they don't believe that he is done. There is a possibility and they cherish this possibility that he may continue his strategic task in this country. And the task is to break up this country from within. This is what- I, I, I say that again, because for me, that's the theme. You know, Russia wants to undo America, turn them against each other. Yeah. Create exactly. chaos, please yes. say, say more. What they failed to do in classic Cold War with their nukes and missiles, right now they want to do, they want to break the country from within. And they focus in dividing, splitting the country. And this is what he has been doing, Putin has been doing for 20 years in Russia and he's staying in power. Mm -hmm. Break up manipulate, corrupt one part of uh, Russia and uh, of the United States uh, uh, population and uh, uh, clash it with, with the opposite group, etc., etc. This is a strategic task. If he is successful in continuing activities in this department, he would be extremely valuable for Russians and Russians would even put him on payroll. By payroll, I, I, I mean the opportunity to build Trump Tower in Crimea, in St. Petersburg, in Moscow. <laughs> but and, and, yeah, go ahead. On the other hand, as I said, that they in transition. The country is pretty bad shape. Economically, yeah. socially, the pressure is growing. Yep. And uh, if he is not good, he cannot be helpful for them anymore. 
I believe there is a possibility and they badly need to improve relations with the United States, with this administration. It's not easy after what they had done against Joe Biden and Democrat, Democrats for four for, for years. So Biden I, even I, called Putin a killer on, in an yeah, interview. Right, right. Yeah. So I wouldn't exclude a possibility when they would exchange or swap compromising materials they have on Donald Trump for some kind of improvement of relations with this administration. Oh, that's very interesting. And, and I also, I can't let you go without asking you to comment about uh, Maria Batun, Batina NRA and assault rifles. Putin would never allow Russian citizens to have military assault rifles, would he? Like, like they're pushing no way. here? No way. If they found uh, this is a popular trick in Russia or, of, of dealing with the dissidents of opponents, uh, they can plant plant around a bullet in the trunk of your car, stop you, and then open the trunk, find one single cartridge, and you're gone for five years. You know? So there is no way they support this kind of, uh, the, this uh, concept in Russia. So the whole operation, the whole idea was designed to get into NRA and to, you know, to do what we're just discussing to do, to try to break the country within and use any possibility you may have. Mm -hmm. And I can't let you go without asking about Alex Jones, because in my research for the cult of Trump, I found out that he had taken 1000 RT propaganda stories you know, spun it up, then Breitbart, and then Fox. Yes, we have to absolutely clearly understand that RT is a successor to the Soviet ghost teleradio, or state Russian TV radio agency. And it was used as traditionally, historically, as a cover for Russian Soviet intelligence operations. For instance, in this country, there were two, two uh, TV correspondents. The one in DC was a real one. The one in New York was the KGB. They had radio correspondent in New York. It was the KGB. So it was like half and half. So by default, RT is not just propaganda tool. This is the front for the Russian intelligence operations which was used by the way, in order to communicate with the Russian intelligence as asset, Julian Assange. So the fact that somebody takes- uh, Why somebody would takes Alex Jones do a thousand stories if he wasn't getting some benefit? Look, I see this several things first, which immediately comes to my mind. Maybe he's just silly. <laughs> he has to understand what the hell is going on. He's a, what Lenin, Vladimir Lenin called useful idiot, which yeah. takes for granted, which really believes in what he is doing. And he really yeah. believes in RT messages, which is crazy to me. Second, it was part of the same operation. So they were working in cahoots. And this is a Russian classic, how they spread misinformation. First, this is some unknown, uh, or little known uh, publication in some country uh, just published the story, breaks the story, no one noticed this. Then big Russian source of mass media picks it up and spreads. And then foreign uh, mass media source, such as Alec Jones publication, fans it. Through, yeah, you know, exactly. Through, and then yeah. Breitbart and then Fox. Right, right. And yes. uh, it became the main mainstream. It's yeah. not a few measure anymore. This is a mainstream news. Yeah. I know that we, we're, we're going long, and I, I, I'm so appreciative of, of both of your time. I'm going to just ask Craig for you to sum, say final thoughts and words, and then you, Yuri, and then we'll wrap up. Right. I, I think what everything Yuri said, and, and, and really this is the lesson of my book, means more than ever that we need a counterintelligence operation. And my book so, starts off saying that, and 
Uh, James Comey was supposedly doing that when he was fired. Uh, Robert Mueller was tasked with doing counterintelligence operation investigation, but he did not do it. And as a result, we've got to get to the bottom of it because we, we've covered a vast array of ways in which Russia is able to corrupt key Americans, uh, to, uh, to spread propaganda and so forth. And if we don't understand that, it's gonna happen again and it's gonna keep on happening and we have to get to the bottom of it. Yeah, thank you. And Yuri, your, your final thoughts or- Yeah, I, I totally support for what Craig just said. You know, We need to change a concept of counterintelligence in this country because uh, FBI, as I understand it, mostly operates on the regulations which were good for classic Cold War, where the spies were the people who worked in the CIA, Pentagon, they take classified documents out there and pass it on to the Soviets through the dead drops. And if they're caught, they're caught red-handed, et cetera, et cetera. In this Cold War 2.0, the most valuable Russian agents are agents of influence. And the previous regulations, they're not good to deal with them. And they're more damaging than the classic spies. So for this, I believe it's what is necessary is to validate what happened and to draw conclusions and maybe change some regulations to adjust them to, to these days. And I would add, you know, you're so brave, uh, Yuri and Craig, uh, we need, uh, journalists to speak truth and hold people accountable. We need courageous whistleblowers to explain to the public what was really going on, you know, behind the scenes. Uh, and, and, and for me, I've been doing this because of my own cult experience. But in my case, it was the American CIA that collaborated with the Korean CIA and, and was doing all kinds of activities that were anti-democratic and fascistic to try to undermine separation of church and state and, and, and liberties and human rights. And, uh, you know, my position is anti-authoritarianism. It doesn't matter what flavor, just I want human rights. I want, I want a, a, a strong independent investigative journalism uh, to be thriving. Uh, I want people to be educated how to be citizens of the world. And I think you said an important point also, Yuri, about globalization. There's a lot of people who are afraid of the future and, and, and they want to contract. And they're being made to be even more afraid of the future, I think, uh, in terms of that influence. But I think we, we need to realize we're on one planet and our climate affects all of us and our future generations. And I think we need to think about our children and our grandchildren and many generations, as opposed to what you were saying, Yuri, about the, the criminals in charge in Russia, they don't care. They just want to enjoy their parties and their power, and they don't care about the future. Um, and I'll just throw in those religious people who think the apocalypse is coming again, so they don't care about politics or, or, or climate, that's another delusion of great concern. Um, we have to be concerned about what's happening. Yep. Thank you so much, everybody. Please buy American Compromat and uh, uh, organize reading groups, contact your local media, because it's frustrating when you do this incredible research to help. And then the mainstream media is like, nah, we're not going to cover that. And why? Why not? This is so important. Right. Thanks a lot, Steve. I appreciate right. it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Many thanks for having us. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.